Hey Middle Earth fans, Roman Nasal here with another video about the Middle Earth role playing game from the 1980s, courtesy of Iron Crown Enterprises. Today we're going to be looking at number 3000 in the campaign series called Rangers of the North, the Kingdom of Arthedane. I was pretty stoked when I saw this back in the late 80s. Bought this from Endless Adventure and I couldn't wait to play it because I've always been a big fan of the Three Kingdoms period in Arnor and how they split up and had to f fight amongst themselves plus Agmar and I couldn't wait to bring this home and see what, a, what it included at the time. Might have paid 18 bucks for this at the time. So I was really, really stoked because Tolkien never really went into much detail about the Kingdom of Arthedane and I wish he had given more details. So basically... What this includes, it includes nine layouts, including villages and an evil seer stronghold. You get four colored maps depicting Fornost, Unanimous, the Shire, and the Northern Frontier. You get the complete description of a Palantir and how it works. And you get to adventure near the Witch King's western border. Search for the lost Palantiri in the frozen waste of Fora Shell. So that's pretty cool. That's not a bad inter introduction to the game. Now this is a second edition book that was released in 1987. Originally, this was released in 1985. Not sure what the difference is between the, between the two editions, other than maybe the map. A little bit better, they're colored. And you get eight full color pages, yep, including the four page spread of Arthedain, plus the maps I mentioned, major layouts. So let's look at the map first. So you can see the color map gives you Arthedain as it would have been in 1640, the third age, just after the Great Plague. And something that Tolkien never really put in was any, any kind of of villages, towns, towers, or fortresses. Oh, he only mentioned Anunimus, Fornos, Uran, and Amansul, which is just down off the corner of this map. It's not actually in this, this module, but you do have Fornos, Uran, and you have Anunimus, which at this time is just nothing but a ruin. Fornos, Uran was, was the capital of Arthedane from, from its inception. Anunimus had been slowly decaying, declining, and by 1409, when the Witch King's forces rampaged through southern Arthedane, it was sacked and no longer habitable. So you do get the northern part of what would become the Shire. And they do have the names of Hobbiton, Scary, Oak Barton, Little Delving. And they also have the, the Elven Haven of Mythlond and the Loon. And they give you another little village called Karas, or town called Karas Salarin. So you do get parts of the Arid Loon and Numeriador between the Loon and the mountains. And then you go up to the Ramas Foreman. So it gives you all these geographical descriptions, uh, the Emin Sul and all that, Emin Uliel. And as much as possible, they do do fill in what Tolkien never never mentioned. Though as much as possible, they do use his work, his terminology and his descriptions. So you flip these over, you get the first one is, you get your basic Fortress Citadel, which I don't think really looked like that back then. That's kind of too much. And then you also get a Arthedain Star Observatory with an old... Dunnish Hill Fort, which is in ruins, and a Riverman camp. So, ob so obviously, there's more than just the Dunedain culture. There's more than just the Dunedain culture within Arthedane. Now, the second map gives you Anunimus, and it also gives you Foranas Urane. Now, Tolkien, Tolkien never really described either city very well. Uh, there's less description of Anunimus than Foranas Urane. Foranas Urane is it's supposed to be defended by a bunch of dikes, so it's kind of like a, a fortress city. But I thought either either description was pretty good. I laminated this one and didn't laminate the other one for whatever reason. I can't remember why. But they do fit together pretty good. And I used to use the the wrist pieces, you know, the red, pink, blue, yellow, green wrist pieces to uh, do the the borders between Arthedain and Angmar because I had other maps, the Angmar map and the Cardolan map, later campaign modules, would connect with this one pretty good. So looking at the book, it's your typical campaign book for this time period. Nothing new there. Goes into a term, definitions and terms, glossaries, adapting the module, no big deal there. Converting, sta converting your stats and combat abilities. Everything's the same as any other book. No, no surprises. But then you go to the in introduction to Arthedain, and again, that 1640 is still the main campaign timeline so you're going to look at the at the land as it is in 1640 for the most part and it's going to talk about the borders of the land so you get the various regions like the baron Duin, the nuniel and the hills of evenden the north downs south arthony and the shire it does touch on the weather hills the white downs and the far downs as well as the blue mountains it does give you the climate 
the flora and fauna, which most, most of the stuff is just filler. You don't really use flora and fauna, except for if you're looking for a certain plant you need. Climate might help, but depends how serious of a game master you are and how picky a perfectionist you are. And then section five talks about the inhabitants of the Barthidane, and it really goes into the description of Numenor. As you can see, you got the Numenorean map of what Numenor looked like before its downfall. Because the Arthidane are our Numenoreans descent. Middle Earth role-playing world, they're the most uh, conservative of the Dunedain. And then it goes into a description of the Palantiri. So if you read the books and you know the Palantiri, there are three of them in the north. One is in, one of them was located in what's called the Emin Beriand, the Tower Hills. And that one only looked westward. It never looked anywhere else but westward. So it was kind of useless to the Dunedain. Elendil used to go there to look over the west to hope to see if he could see Numenor again. But it was drowned under, under the sea. The next one was placed in Anunimus. But the Anunimus stone was moved to Fornos Uraine when Anunimus fell into, dis, into disrepair and ruin and was held in Fornos. And the last one in the north was in Amansul, or Weathertop. Now, when the Witch King tried to sack Amansul, the stone of Amansul was carried to safety to Fornos Uraine in 1409. And then later, in the last invasion, the last invasion in 1973, Fornos Uranus is, is sacked and taken, but the stones go north to the Forosho, the bay where the Lawsoth live. You can't really see it on this map. Just a tiny sliver in the corner there. And there, the last King Arvidu has the two stones with him. But he gets, he gets taken aboard an elven ship that rest, come to rescue him after a harsh winter. And... The ship flounders in the ice and sinks, and the two stones are lost. And we'll get back to that later. So going back to this, after it talks about the Palantiri, it talks more about Numenorean culture, the rise of Numenorean night, and then the founding of the Realms of Exile among the downfall. So even before the downfall of Numenor, there were already Dunedain living within Arthedain and Cardolan. The ones in Arthedain are described as being the most pure, so they're purest elf friends, while the Cardolani are more, although they are, too, they too are elf friends, they're considered more mercantile. And then it goes into the kingdom of Arnor and then Wah, and the, the birth of Arthur and Cardinal and Rudor. Tolkien never really goes into much detail as to why the kingdom split up. Just talks about dissension among the sons of the last king of Arnor. The death of the 10th and last Arnorian king, Erendur, left the North Kingdom's loyalty split among his three surviving sons, each battling for a piece of the scepter of Anunimus. Aimlath of Fornost, Erendur's eldest son, and therefore, the heir of all of Arnor, he got Arthedain and the three seeing stones. The other two sons, one got Cardolan, and the other got Rudar. They squabbled over the seeing stone at Amansul. Arthedain controlled it for the most part. So then it splits off into the sister wars because they did fight over possession of Amansul, all three kingdoms. And then it talks about the Arthedainian culture, social structure, its warcraft, and scattered peoples, which is kind of cool. Arthedain is more of a fe is a feudal society and doesn't have a huge military to back up. Then it goes and talks about the Lawsoth. The Lawsoth are basically like uh, Inuit type people. They live in the far north, don't have a lot of contact with things, and it talks about their society and how they live. Then it also touches upon the Breelanders because the Breelanders are not Arth are not Dunedain. They are more related to the Dunlanders, but they've always been there. There's always been a settlement within around Bree and the Breeland, which has one big village, Bree, and then three smaller ones. It also has hobbits. It was settled by hobbits before the Shire. Then it talks about the Dunland, Dunlandings, the Dunmen, who migrate up there. And then you also have the Rivermen, who are more akin to the Northmen, who ply the rivers. And then it goes into the, the hobbits of the Shire. So it talks about the founding of the Shire and the journey of the, of the hobbits themselves. Marco and Blanco Falahide were the acknowledged leaders and they got the Shire grant. Then in section six, it talks about the politics and power of Arthedain. So the wars with Angmar, the Witch King of Angmar. These wars have been going on since 1356 of the Third Age. They'll continue on until 1974, 75 of the Third Age. So we're talking about a 600 year old war, back and forth. There's periods of great fighting with lulls of inactivity as both sides rebuild and recoup. But basically, Angmar continues to pressure. They keep pressure on Arthedain. It talks about the great invasion of 1409, which saw the destruction of Amansul, the death of the last king in Cardolan, the sack of Anunimus, really damaged Arthedain and almost completely wiped out Cardolan. So then we got the Arthedain military structure. Now, I thought this was cool. This is what I wanted. It talks about the various branches in arms. And then it goes into the petty wars from 1410 to 1640, before eventually... 
talking about the Great Plague, what happens after the Great Plague, and the preoccupation of Gondor. Because by 1410, Gondor was in the Civil War and couldn't really do much. And then the politics of the royal court. So Arthedine, though Tolkien never mentioned this, because he, his description of Arthedine was so, so bare bones that the people at Iron Crown decided to make their own. And they gave, the king had set seven very powerful nobles. So there'd be seven great noble families and then 56 minor families. And the king has to balance everything there. Then has politics of the countryside, organization. Then it goes into the politics and the seers. So the seers are the people who control the palantir. And it talks about how, how they function. Then we go on to trade. Nothing big there. When you play these games, you don't really worry about trade, except for maybe if you're a bad guy and you want to take on a caravan or a trade or, or somebody, you know, do a Robin Hood. Or you get hired as a car- as a guard for a, tra- for, for a merchant. Next, they go to the places of note. So they have the two capitals, the Weather Hills. They don't really give a description of Amun Sul. There is a book on that, a very short one. And then it goes into Brie. Again, they don't really do much with Brie in this book. Brie has its own little adventure book, which I'll cover later. And then it goes into Cardolan and the Haunted Barrow Downs. Because the Barrow Downs are, were part of the northern border of Cardolan and Arthur. And then it has the Shire, the White Towers of the Tower Hills. So it gives you the map again with a basic key. It does list the seven great houses, which are pretty cool. The Tarmas, the Akedas, Oros, Hyarn, Emery, Foros, and Noiren. Of those seven, six of them are listed for places in Numenor, like areas. That's where the houses came from. But the second one, the Akedas, are, are actually named after a short sword, the Aket. Inside, and then it gives you the border with Arth, with Angmar. Angmar has situated 12 orc tribes along the frontier with Arthedain, so they can apply constant pressure through raids. And I thought that was a kind of a cool concept. It's kind of like Rome with the barbarians. There's always something going on along the border, and it made it hard for Rome to react. Then it gives you a sample village outside the norm, the village of Rude, and then the Grey Havens in the North Downs. The North at other times, so the so the tenuous ties to, to Gondor. It wasn't until the 19th, the 20th century that Gondor and Arthedain renewed ties because they've been strained during the kin strife. Gondor could never give that much aid to Arthedain when it really needed it. And when they did send aid, it was too late. And Arbidu, the last king of Arthedain, actually had a very good claim to Gondor, but they didn't accept his claim because he had married into the Gond- Gondorian royal family, and there was still a male descendant of Anarion. So they again bypassed. Had they not done that, things might have been different. And they had Melbourne the seer talk about it, which is kind of cool. Then it gives the, the line of the Dunedain kings in Arthedain. It starts with the Anorian ones and then goes right down to the, the Arthedainian ones, which I always loved. If you look into the history of Middle-earth books, it actually mentions a lot more things about things, guys, especially Aravel, 1813, 1891. Apparently in the history of Middle-earth series, when Tolkien was writing, he mentioned that Aravel won a great victory over Angmar but, and then tried to repopulate Cardolan but could not because of the fear of the, uh, the Barrowites. I took that idea and did it even further where they invaded much sooner. But I'll talk about that in another time. So with the fall, then it talks about the icy death of Arvidu, the last king of Arthedain in 1975, and then the lost kingdom, all the way up to 3021 at the end of the Third Age. For 1,050 years, let's say, Arthedain has been a lost kingdom. That's a long time to hold a memory. That's like today us holding dear the the Roman Empire and then trying to bring it back or the Byzantine Empire would be more apt. So then it goes into the Rangers of the North and the schooling of the Rangers, how they're how they're formed. Tolkien hints at this but never really mentions it. But all the Rangers of the North under Aragorn during the War of the Ring are all Dunedain. You don't see any other races and they mention this in this book too because the Dunedain have that in legitimacy that would otherwise be diluted if they let other races, other mannish races in. So then it talks about the Rangers of the North and gives you the list of all the chieftains. The Years of the Wild, Aragorn's and the Ring Quest, and then finally the Fourth Age. And then it gives you the huge, the big timeline. So there's a lot of background information in this, which was really cool. And I loved it because, like I said, Tolkien never went into much detail about what happened in the North. And this was a way to do it. So while it's not canon, it definitely makes more sense than uh, 
what Games Workshop has done with R with Arnor, which is right there. I have the Arnorians for the King's Games Workshop, which is cool. I wish they'd do more. And then it gives you a prominent personality. So it starts off with Arvaleg the First from 1409, who led the fight during that invasion and died. And then it has Malborn, the Tainted Seer. So it has a seer who is turned to evil. And then in 1640, it has Marco, Marcho, Marco and Blanco Falahide, the guys who started the Shire. They got the grant. And Argello the Second as well as Marl Tarma, who's, a, who's related to the king, but he wa wants to be a king. And the Tarmas, they want the lands that the Shire's in, because the Shire lands were once fruitful and had lots of people, but the 1409 invasion kind of killed everyone off. Then in 1974, you get the, the characters of Arvidu, the last king, Malbeth, the seer who made the famous quote, Aranarth, the crown prince, who becomes the first chief in the north. So it's kind of interesting that after the destruction of Arthedain, Aranarth, the first chieftain, Never tried to reestablish a kingdom anywhere, but when kind of went into hiding so that Sor Sauron wouldn't look for him. Then it has the chief person, Buker Buka of the Marish. And then late Third Age has Bilbo Frodo. And does mention Sharky and Loth Sharky and Lotho. And it has Mary Pippin Sam for the Fourth Age. And does give the description of Arth of uh, Aragorn. So that's kind of cool. As well as Gandalf. Can't have Arthur name without Gandalf. This was Gandalf's main area. Riador. So it does give a description of the ring that Gandalf had, the three rings, and Aragorn the second's description. Then we get into adventures. This is the first book that really had really cool adventures. You have the Terror Among the Tombs adventure where you go to the library of Anunimus and try and find certain books at a time when the, when the Witch King's invasion was going on. Because the Witch King's army hit Amun Sul and once it, once it defeated the, the Arnorian, the Arthedain Cardellani force at Amun Sul, it came in towards Bree. It fought in the, in the Barrow Downs against the last Cardellani forces and destroyed them and then moved up into Anunimus. So it ransacked all through this area. It couldn't, they couldn't take Fornos Uraine. They were trying to take it from the south, but they couldn't do it. The Crown Prince of Arthedain at the time wrecked their army in a series of battles from among the North Downs. And then with help from elves from Linden, they were able to drive back the forces of Angmar. So this entire region just just got so that adventures among the is that anonymous at the old library. And Malborn the Tainted Seer is the enemy. He's trying to stop you. And then sixteen forty of what's called the intrigue in Fornos where the Tarmas are trying to take control of the government because they think Argel the second is kind of weak. And also then the next one is you have a frontier fight where you're trying to stop a renegade ranger who's got a small keep called the Bari Dongorath, which is just seen on the map of the tip there. He's between no man's land. He's like just being being a dick, not helping out, and you gotta take him out. So you have another one called Def Defending the Frontier in 3019. During or soon after the War of the Ring, you can def help defend the Shire or the Frontier. And then the fourth age has got the cool one, the quest for the the Lost Stones. So the, the writers decided, hey, let's bring the two Lost Stones of Anunimus and Amon Sul up from the from the water and have them come ashore. And you also have an adventure in the village of Rude where you're trying to get more bandits out of the way. And then it gives you other scenario type ideas. Then it goes into the layouts and floor plans, finally. So you got the, the Tainted Seer's observatory. He has his own little observatory, Melbourne. And I thought that was kind of cool. You have a stargazing thing. And then you have the Royal Library at Anonymous, which is partly ruined. And it gives a description of all the various rooms that you need. You go into the town of Rude, which is located between Fornos Uran and, and Anonymous. Then you have the vill lost of village of Molkin. And for some reason, this book didn't have... They made a mistake, so they had to give you a printout of what the village looks like and had it here on page 47. But it was loose. And then finally, you have Dungoras Hold, which is just a small little minor fortification that wouldn't stand up to a serious orc attack. But it actually makes pretty good setting when you want to do, like, bandits fight bandits or have be a bandit yourself and then finally you have the site of the palantiri with the loss i'll put them in this cave so i thought that was kind of cool and then of course you get your beast layer so it could be either a troll or, or a small dragon it's up to you or even a huge bear and then we go to the charts the last thing they have the master beast chart things that heal and harm and then my favorite as always the master military chart so it gives you the Angmaran strength at its probably at a low point. It gives you the Royal Guard, Trolls, Rangers, Trackers, Horsemen, and Footmen. So there's three. they have 3,000 cavalry and 10,000 infantry, foot infantry. And then it has the 12 Orc tribes that are 
on the raid upon the border, as well as some, some trolls of the north. And then it goes into the royal army of Card of Arthedan. And then it goes into the noble armies. It doesn't mention the militia, so the levy, or yeoman, or any uh, citadel guards. So the city of Fornos Uriam would have its own own little military, but it just goes into those two armies. And then it gives you the others like the bandits at Dungoroth, Melbourne's men, the Lossoth, the Hobbits. And then finally you get your non-playing characters from all these different eras, which are pretty interchangeable. And then last but not least, you have the Master Encounter chart. So if you're in a certain area, you roll a dice, and this is what you're going to find. Overall, I love this game scenario. This campaign module was, like I said, the best one so far because it had so much variety. And as far as military goes, you, you put this with Angmar, and you can have both kingdoms wail away at each other because the Dunedain were physically stronger than the orcs and men that Angmar had. So that's why they had to have more. And... It's just like Lord of the Rings. Mordor had to have thousands. They had to outnumber them 10 to 1 to really destroy the, the Dunedain of Gondor. And the same with that Arthedain. They had to use overwhelming numbers, and it took them 600 years to do it. Peter Jackson never really got that through in his movie, which kind of sucked. And we never got to see what Bocce had in mind. I would have liked to have seen Ralph Bocce finish his, his Lord of the Rings series. But like I said, I played this with lots of friends in the 80s and 90s, and it was really cool. I really loved this. Now the mid-90s Iron Crown combine this module with a bunch of other modules, rewrote some stuff and put it in one huge book. And we'll get to that later. But anyway, anyone who's ever played this, let me know what you guys thought of that book, this book. I loved it. And I would like to know if anyone else, you had it and played with it. Anyway, until next time, this is Roman Dasel. I'm out of here.